I think the key thing to consider there is what you define the city. The entire extent of the Nile could be defined as an 800 kilometer long city, um, which is continuously urbanized. That's the urban condition that I think the autonomous vehicle is really going to benefit. And then essentially every car is an autonomous, potentially autonomous vehicle. It becomes part of a atomized public transportation system, which is, which is totally amazing. So it's so lovely to be here, um, big fan of Kickstarter for, for many, many years. Um, I've got this panel here. I, it feels a little bit like an episode of The Bachelor. Um, but you know, essentially I, I have a bunch of rock stars here, so it's super exciting. And um, we're gonna look at the, uh, at the topic of urban mobility, but before we get to that, um, I thought it'd just be interesting to ask each one of these a question as a way of introduction. So um, to my immediate right is uh, Joseph Grima. He is the uh, newly installed Idea City Director at the New Museum, and he is co-commissioner of the first architecture biennial in Chicago. So Joseph, um, I've got to ask, Chicago, why Chicago? Everyone's uh, talking about Chicago. What's up with that mayor? <laughs> <laughs> that mayor's got drive, man. He's, yeah. uh, no, he's, he's a force of nature, and um, I think he, this, I mean, the biennial is really his project. He deeply believes in that the first biennial of architecture in North America should be at, in Chicago, and it makes all sorts of sense. I mean, Chicago is the birthplace of the skyscraper. It's really a kind of an ongoing laboratory of uh, modernity in many ways, and not only in architecture, but certainly I think where um, in many ways the modern city was born. And it's really a kind of an ongoing sandbox for how the modern city responds to a set of challenges that are still ongoing. I think so that, that in, in many ways Chicago is, uh, is the place that this biennial should um, take place, not only because of what it's achieved, but also because of, because of, all, of all its glories, but also because of all the failures. Uh, and those failures are really symptomatic of not just of that city, but of so many others. So I think it's, it's not so much this first edition that we'll be inaugurating in October, but over the next two, five, 10, 20 editions, I mean, think of the extraordinary experiments that can take place in the city. It's gonna be amazing. Um, and then to my very far, far right is uh, Bjarke Ingels, uh, founder of BIG, B-I-G, um, working on major projects, impactful projects, cultural projects, commercial projects around the world. Um, but of course, I'm going to have to ask about Google. Um, and really interested in what was those first couple of meetings like? Were they with Larry and Sergey? And was there a design brief? Um, how did they present to you um, what they wanted? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, the, the, the funny thing was like, actually as the sort of uh, job pre-qualifications, they asked for an 18 minute uh, video that uh, Larry would be able to watch on his uh, handheld device, uh, which like, uh, uh, which, which already sort of um, meant that we had to do something that we're not like fully, uh, you know, equipped to, uh, to do. And then I, the, the, our first conversation, um, it became clear to me that, the, that he, I think even over the last decade or something, he's been talking about certain uh, ideas. And I, I have a feeling that, because they, they've started, they've initiated uh, a few projects before that uh, haven't really been uh, realized. And it was my feeling that uh, uh, it felt as if the other architects hadn't taken the ideas. For instance, like, right now we're doing like these free landscapes underneath this sort of glass canopy of like almost like a glass fabric uh, that has this like very utopian kind of feeling, but it's driven by a, some kind of pragmatism. And I just had a feeling that the, the other architects simply said, ah, yeah, that's just like a utopian uh, craziness. Let's, let's design him some buildings. Uh, and I think um, the, the reason that we're still talking is I think we, we, we decided like, why don't we for once, like it's almost like an inversion of our typical role is to have a client that's very professional at what they do, uh, and then our job is to sort of try to like take their parameters and use it to take them a little bit further than they would normally be willing to go. Uh, in this case, it was more like taking some uh, some some crazy ideas and trying to say, okay, we'll uh, we'll try to uh, you know we'll try to make it rational. 
And then I, then I think one, one thing that I noticed is when you're working for a company that is like Kickstarter, like a sort of a, a, a software uh, company or like an, an, an enabler where you, you have some initial uh, expenses in terms of research and coding and development, and then if you strike an ore, then you can scale it infinitely, is that there is a willingness towards non-recoverable engineering or design, as you would call it in the architecture langu language, that there is a willingness to invest quite massively in something if it will eventually deliver something that can then be uh, scaled. So there's no desire to pave the floors in gold or uh, in marble, uh, but there is a desire to spend significant resources on, on trying to arrive at something that doesn't yet exist on the market, but if you would get there, then it would actually be affordable and available and scalable. And, and that's something that, a belief in design and architecture and development that I haven't seen uh, in many clients. Sounds very much a dream project. And um, Hamish Smith, senior designer at Pentagram. Um, people say um, publishing is dead. <laughs> and um, so here I have this beautiful book you made, which is the New York City Transit Authority Graphics Standard Manual. Yeah. Um, you were trying to raise $100,000 to make this book happen on Kickstarter. You raised eight hundred thousand dollars. So, what was the big surprise here? Why were people interested in this book? Who was interested in this book? Um, th this book is sort of like to graphic designers. Um, it's sort of like the uh, Gutenberg Bible or something. But that's sort of a bad analogy because that would be amazing too. But <laughs> this is sort of like finding. When we found this, it was it was a bit of a special day and we had a sort of a moment. But um, I think to, to graphic designers it is this amazing thing, but it has broader appeal in that it's New York City subway um, and it's so train nerds and subway nerds are into it. Um, but it's also just um, for the general public, I think, uh, I think a lot of people didn't even realize that this sort of manual existed for projects, and that was an interesting thing that we found. So I think like Slate picked it up, and they were sort of their story was about manuals um, and, and how amazing it was that these things were planned and you know implemented. And architects and designers know that that happens for everything, but I think some people who who hadn't known that sort of picked that up, and that was the third sort of key interest point. And, and we reached a, a broad sort of audience that way. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Absolutely amazing. Um, so first softball question, um, I'm just going to ask each of you, if you were mayor of New York City, what's the one big change you would make for New York City? So Hamish, will you kick it off for sure. us? Well, it's easy. I mean, you can imagine. Oh, it um, is? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, would... I guess I'm voting for you. Wow. Okay. Um, Obviously, day one, before I would bring this back, I'd bring back the Vignelli diagram, which is the, the map that Massimo Vignelli designed, which looks like the colorful spaghetti. Um, if you're a designer, you will know about it. Uh, so I'd bring that back day one. It's already updated. It's on the weekender.com right now, so it's ready to go. So I'd bring that back, and then I would uh, bring back the signage. But on a more serious note, I would continue sort of the work that uh, the DOT is doing right now to try and integrate all of New York's transport into one graphic language um, through design and architecture and, and uh, product design on the streets. Okay. Bjarke, if you were Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, it, it ends up sounding like I'm almost like unfit to live in this city because uh, uh, there, there is like a, a, you know, American technology, American innovation, American sort of uh, is really pioneering in so many ways. Like it is the other city that claims uh, that to have invented uh, the skyscraper. Uh, and uh, but there's one thing where where like New York and America maybe in general is incredibly primitive, and that's like on mechanical engineering and noise levels. Like even now we can hear that it sounds like there's a bus parked somewhere uh, <laughs> up in the ceiling. Uh, which, and I think, you know, because there is this like incredible drive towards innovation in, in America, like if the mayor would simply just prohibit 
uh, you know, noise emitting uh, HVAC units in every single uh, window in uh, every single uh, building. I, I would bet that Kickstarter or any other sort of uh, entity that deals with uh, bringing new products from, to market would be able to deliver instantly. And I think you, you might hear birds singing uh, on Broadway, uh, which, which right now you can't hear it between. Also, that's why like uh, fire uh, trucks and uh, you know, ambulances in, in New York City are sort of 10 times more noisy in any other city is just, just to get beyond the ambient noise of a thousand HVAC units is almost uh, impossible. So, so I think like as a, as a sad proposal for innovation, I think actually some kind of a noise legislation could really drive uh, a, ho a whole new city. <laughs> we're, we're getting really specific uh, here. <laughs> Joseph, kind of, kind of bring us back I've, to... I've always assumed it was some sort of reverberation with the height of the buildings, so that these trucks that blast down the avenues make this insane amount of noise, but... Yeah, I guess it's a kind of a, a lack of sensitivity to, or a, a, yeah, becoming accustomed to noise. So, and if you were mayor? If I were mayor. Uh, I, well, European cities in, I guess up until pretty much like the 18th or 19th centuries had all these um, toll points. They'd, they would basically be uh, completely surrounded by walls and they'd have these toll points where you'd have to stop when you were entering the city and uh, pay a certain amount of duty in order to be able to enter the city or if you're exiting the city. Um, and I think that I would introduce around the five boroughs uh, uh, some sort of fence and a series of toll points where you would actually have to renounce any claim to copyright and transform New York into a completely copyright-free innovation zone where anything can be freely copied, uh, freely manipulated like, uh, like that, this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and freely reproduced and freely downloaded and freely uploaded. And I bet that the speed of innovation in the city would be, like it would absolutely blow away any other city in New York, or in, in, the, in the US or around the world in a matter of uh, weeks or months even. All right, that's what's going to happen if you have designers running for mayor. Um, <laughs> Make New York like China. <laughs> so, so I was given the, the task of um, choosing a topic under the umbrella of sustainability, and I think we all know that's a big word to tackle, incredibly provocative, many ways to read it. And it just seemed, um, while I had these uh, three great minds, to kind of focus us a little bit more and look at urban mobility here in New York City. Um, as we all know, New York City has a mayor's office of, of sustainability. Um, the way they talk about transportation is really about efficiency. So more people on trains and subways, uh, buses moving from point A to B a little faster. Uh, maybe our cars should be a little cleaner, maybe there will be electric cars. Um, and uh, there's not that much, as far as I could tell in my scant research, that um, there's that much innovation. Uh, so uh, I've chosen uh, four uh, topics that we're going to quickly run through, maybe about seven minutes a piece, uh, and then we will open it up to the floor for uh, Q&A. Um, so my first topic that I'm really fascinated by um, are driverless cars. And Biake, I know you, you share a fascination about driverless cars, and now that you are spending so much time with Google, I thought you might have some insight about um, what, uh, what's up with driverless cars. Is this a, a real uh, reality? Uh, is this a solution? Um, for urban mobility in metropolitan, a uh, metropolis, a uh, metropolis. Um, I could tell you, but then I would have to kill you. <laughs> uh, I, I actually, I had never heard the word NDA before I moved to America, <laughs> and now I know what it means. Uh, but um, no, but I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I have an incredible faith in it, and uh, and uh, it, it, it is a fact that it's coming out, and I think. The, the, the current thinking, and I, I think this is common knowledge, is that uh, to start by bringing out uh, the driverless car as a vehicle that has a limited uh, top speed, so it falls under a different legislation, and then to uh, primarily market it towards uh, people that have disabilities that would otherwise be unable to drive their own car. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a genius way to get the product out there. 
uh, and like there's no doubt that the, the technology is there and in the beginning it's a, it's a, it's a habit and then there's like a, a massive uh, legislative hurdle. But I think once it's there, of course it totally transforms then, uh, you know, then essentially every, every car is an autonomous, potentially autonomous vehicle that once it drops off its owner or its passenger, it can either park itself, but why even park itself? Why not just, just keep uh, bringing others? So essentially every, every car becomes a, uh, you know, a, a, a privately owned or like even communally owned part of a, of a public transportation system. It means that when you're outside city limits, maybe you can even take over the steering wheel and drive the car yourself. But once you enter into city limits, it becomes part of a atomized public transportation system, which is, which is totally amazing. And in time, like right now, they're being designed to be fully autonomous, so they can operate on cars, uh, like on streets that have like normal human, uh, sort of imperfect uh, drivers. But, uh, but in time, the, the possibility for the vehicles to communicate will also allow much more sophisticated ways of con controlling uh, congestion and, and you know, uh, uh, flow so you can actually increase the capacity on, on narrow corridors or you can redistribute traffic. Just like, for instance, right now when you ask uh, Google Maps about a route, it can show you the congestion. Uh, and I'm not even sure this is true, but my, 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 my theory is that it's because each handheld device that has allowed Google Maps to know your position then signals back to uh, the central coordinating brain that uh, you know, all the phones that are on this uh, street are moving quite slow right now. So therefore, you can see that maybe I should uh, redirect the traffic in other directions. So I think it will do for life between the buildings uh, what uh, any kind of sort of software optimization uh, logarithm has done for all, all kinds of other aspects of life. So, so, so no doubt it's going to be a, a, a revolution. Actually, actually, maybe just to add, um, Working for Google, like they really uh, drank the Kool-Aid when it comes to uh, like uh, one of the first things I got from uh, the CFO of Google was he gave me an electric skateboard. <laughs> so like, and then he moves around it on it uh, himself, and I, and I think right now we're actually uh, uh, working uh, on, on trying to invent some other much more sort of Jetsons-esque ways of uh, of solving the. The, the, the local transportation issues in, uh, in Mountain View, because like, if you look at the areas where Google has offices in, in Mountain View and the adjacent municipalities, it's, it's an area that stretches from the north of Central Park all the way to the south tip of Manhattan. So uh, within that zone, any kind of sort of urban mobility innovation would really make a, a difference. I mean, if, we, if New York City were g going to a grid of driverless cars, it would just seem to me that would signage then become embedded, Absolute. invisible, yeah. obsolete? Like, walk me through what, how, you know, what would Pentagram do about this? Yeah, I think um, it's, there would be a period of decades, I think, where you would have to have sort of a mixed system. I don't know how driverless cars read signs, but I think the current models sort of do an OCR um, character recognition, which seems clumsy and sort of unwieldy. And I think you could move to something that was more, um, I hate QR codes, but QR codes on signs instead of words on signs. So maybe there's a period of mixed use like that. And then when, drive, when it will happen, driverless cars are the norm, um, it might be a while away. But then I think you go to a system that is signless. Um, and then I think, you know, signs on the road now are sort of, it, you go outside and signs are just like a visual disease. They're really everywhere. We're sort of used to it, so we don't notice them, but if you take a second, there's road signs everywhere and they're, they're vehicle scaled, so you can see them from 300 feet away. And to do without that will really help to sort of beautify the streets, but also I think you can then reduce the scale of signs and, and make them more human scale. So you could have extra wayfinding, or um, street signs wouldn't have to be 12 feet high; they could just be eight feet high. Um, as a, you know, so so you reduce the clutter, but also make it more friendly for pedestrians. And then Joseph, um, just on a more macro level, um, right now in the United States, only 
uh, four states have passed laws for driverless cars, and those include California, Nevada, Michigan, and Florida. So that would suggest to me these are larger states with big open road systems, and you know clearly where places for driverless cars are better places for prototyping. I mean, do you really see um, driverless cars working in, in such dense places like New York? Yeah, so uh, I think it's a really interesting question. The, uh, my friend Dan Hill, who's the director of the uh, Future Cities Catapult in London, is, he always says that um, the city we inhabit is the city that was built by cars while we weren't looking. And uh, I think it's really, really, um, it, it completely captures this kind of tendency towards sprawl that uh, has crept over us, has really absorbed the city over the last hundred years. And that has really, I think, kind of set um, a very specific kind of mindset um, in play, which I think the, 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 the self-driving car is really a result of this kind of assumption that we uh, kind of li live in distributed fashion. Of course, the move um, in many places like the ones that you um, mentioned and also where we uh, here in New York is towards ever increasing densification. If you look at uh, just driving in from JFK this afternoon, the, uh, the Vignoli skyscraper on the skyline, and I think that's a real, that's something would have really been unthinkable in real estate terms 10 or 20 years ago for a residential to be that high. It was always, previously it was always um, commerce or offices uh, that were uh, kind of occupying the highest echelons of the city. And, and of course now that's inverted and it's, uh, it's residential. Uh, and so the modern city in many ways uh, was, it, it started out incredibly dense and then it moved to this kind of distributed sprawl condition and then it um, uh, came back to being dense again. But I think the, the thing that's really important to remember is that in fact, these conditions of density are actually, we are always saying that you kind of hear this every other minute in um, the kind of architecture urbanism world, that more than half of the world's population now lives in cities and by um, 20, in 20 years from now it's going to be 70% and so on. But I think the key thing to consider there is what you define as city. And we always think when you say city, you think of New York, you think of kind of high density environment like this. But in fact, when, uh, when you speak of this 50% um, statistic, uh, the definition of city is actually something completely different. It's more like uh, the, the, the Nile, for example, the entire extent of the Nile could be defined as an 800 kilometer long city um, which is continuously urbanized over an incredibly long ribbon shape um, strip that kind of goes deep down into Africa and uh, and that's the mobility that's the urban condition that I think the driverless car is going to um, or the autonomous vehicle is really going to benefit um, is conditions that are a little bit like in Mountain View that are really kind of um, uh, uh, sort of um, extended, um, really sort of shredded out into very um, long, narrow strips. Um, and all sorts of th this sort of um, condition that actually breaks away from the density that we are actually incredibly privileged to live in. So kind of now shifting away from Blade Runner ideas, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about bicycles. Uh, very controversial here in New York City. Um, I looked up some statistics. I was very surprised to find out how safe New York City is for bicycles. Um, in 2013, only 13 deaths, deaths involving bicycles with an average of 12 injuries a day in total for the five boroughs. Um, so, uh, Bjarke, you hail from Copenhagen, probably the utopia of, uh, of bicyclists. Um, what's your anecdotal analysis, because I know you ride bikes a lot, of, of bikes and city bikes here in New York City? Uh, I mean, I, I think uh, it's much safer to bike in New York City because you have so, much, so, so many fewer bicyclists, and I think they're definitely the most dangerous people in, uh, in traffic. <laughs> so uh, the, the absence of bicycle congestion still makes it a bicycle haven. Also, the fact that the, the policemen don't uh, ticket, at least to my experience, you for uh, you know riding the bicycle on the sidewalk or uh, you know like the sidewalks are so wide that it's like uh, incredible. So like I think in that sense. Uh, okay, so no wonder it's safe. Yeah, I, th I think like <laughs> exactly, like, yeah, yeah, exactly, you know there are no cars on the sidewalks. Uh, no, but I I, th I think uh, it it is a myth 
I mean, of, of course it is dangerous to, to ride a bicycle uh, on a street where everybody else is in a, an armored truck, but that's just how it is. And I think um, it, that, that's the same condition you have everywhere in the world. But we haven't uh, seen New York make any real design moves for bicycles. I know you um, were uh, the designer of quite an amazing park in Copenhagen, which kind of stitched together a number of neighborhoods, almost like this idea of, of what you were talking about, Joseph, a ribbon, um, which was very much um, appropriate for bicyclists to, to engage and, and for people to use it as a place for transportation as well as recreation. Um, why, why, are we, why, don't we have more, why don't we have anything like that going on right now in New York? I think right now what's going on is that the, there is actually a, a, a rapidly growing amount of uh, dedicated lanes uh, for bicycles. Actually, New York City has more uh, miles of bicycle lane than Copenhagen has. I mean, it's also a bigger city. Uh, but uh, I, think that, I think that's step one. And then I really think step two is to introduce the level change, uh, where the, the bicycle lane just simply gets lifted uh, you know, two or three inches from uh, the rest of the, then it becomes really uncomfortable for a car to like uh, uh, butt, butt over. Because like right now, it's, it's kind of a, a fading graphic that the, if, uh, the, the, the worst thing you can do as a bicyclist is to trust that any, anyone else but you sees it. So, uh, so I think in the beginning, the, the condition, I think in, in, uh, in Copenhagen, bicyclists are incredibly, incredibly privileged and, and, and incredibly righteous. Uh, so I think if you drive like a Dane in New York, you're gonna die in like uh, 10 minutes. But I think uh, as long as you understand that it's the, it's the wild west of bicycles, then you actually have more space as you do in the wild west. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's just a question of, uh, and, and I think even while I've been living here, you can see that the, uh, the amount of bicycles on the streets have exploded. It has. So it's, it has, it's only a question yeah. of, uh, uh, of a few years. So, so Hamish, um, and I'm sure there's many other folks in, in the room like me, um, um, I'm, I have a bicycle, I love riding my bicycle. Um, I hate riding my bicycle into Manhattan, mm -hmm. I don't. Um, so, you know, if you were in charge of a campaign to get more folks like me to ride my bike, how, how might you engineer that? Um, I don't think any sort of advertising or PR or campaign like that can get a significant amount of riders on bikes. I think the biggest advertisement for riding your bike is just more cyclists, more, sorry, bicyclists um, on the roads. Um, but yeah, the problem here is that illusion of safety of the painted line. And I think the only way to continue improving or continue getting people to ride is to is, is the DOT, they control all of the bike lanes and all of the roads and um, we work with them on city bike to, to implement the mapping system um, which does encourage you to, to explore with, um, tells you how far things are and where the bike lanes are but until they start implementing more of the, I think they call them the Copenhagen lanes which are the protected lanes, um, those are the real sort of safe feeling lanes where you have cars parked or actually a median, um, or I like the, the raised thing is even better. I think the only way to increase ridership is through street design and smarter street design, which is happening, but it's, it's really tough to do things in New York. You change one parking spot and people get annoyed, you know, <laughs> so let alone a whole strip. Actually, you know, like in, uh, sort of in Southern Europe, uh, you only have these sort of serpentine roads. Sometimes you see like a cross and that's uh, where somebody died in some kind of fatal accident. Uh, they, imp they imported that in Copenhagen where they just like, in some right turn situations, there was like a high frequency of ac accidents and then they just simply placed a, a giant red X uh, on the pavement so that everybody would be aware that, okay, this is a, this is a, tricky, uh, yeah. a tricky place. And then, Joseph, trying to wrap these the first issue and the second issue together. I um, would love to know your opinion. So in one idea, a lot of people are moving to a system which is autonomous, and then yet there's many folks who still so much believe in this idea of getting on your bike and, and, and cycling, so something then is very much about the individual. I mean, can all these different almost oppositional systems 
coexist in our city? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because it's, um, there's a lot of talk about how um, Uber, the, the fact that Uber kind of absorbing livery drivers and uh, taxi drivers into its system and gra gradually coming to replace the medallion system is simply a first step towards the, until the arrival of autonomous vehicles and Uber will become completely uh, dependent auton on autonomous vehicles. It'll basically be a company that employs very few people uh, and owns a ton of um, self-driving cars. Um, uh, I guess the, uh, I was reading a very interesting proposal by somebody who was very um, afraid of the situation of, uh, of kind of all of the, the taxi drivers um, being completely replaced and was proposing a legislative uh, this actually could be a good proposal for a mayor. Uh, he was proposing that um, self-driving cars uh, should not be owned by massive corporations like Uber, uh, but they should actually be owned by themselves. So they should basically have uh, a degree of um, kind of uh, self-ownership, like each car is basically a company on wheels. Um, and as the car goes around, and then uh, to the degree in which it's capable of learning its environment and uh, figuring out where to hang out, um, and uh, providing a good service, uh, and also making investments uh, as it kind of um, grows in, uh, as its wealth grows, as it collects cash, it can then replace its seats or add features like uh, air conditioning or better music. It would have, it would learn what kind of music is most popular, and certain cars would become more profitable. Um, and then, and so each car would be, be like a micro um, enterprise, and the ones that kind of made the back, and so it would become this sort of evolutionary model in which the city's transportation would be completely outsourced to essentially algorithms, um, which is actually kind of a completely frightening proposition in itself. So, um, so maybe we'll actually end up as in protest against algorithms running our public transportation system will all end up being on bikes, so then we're back to, uh, uh, <laughs> back to bikes, yeah, that's it. Um, in, the, um, in the transportation um, kind of goals for, for the city, um, there's no mention of, um, of our waterways, of the East River, of the Hudson River, and, um, and I'm kind of bewildered. Um, I mean, as a city, we don't really seem to embrace our rivers, um, either for recreation or transportation. And um, Bjarke, I want to kick this off with you because I know you have a recent project over at the Brooklyn Bridge Park. It's this lovely viewing platform to look at the water. I mean, was there any talk or discussion to um, engage with the water? You know, why, why is it not a, a pier for, or a, a place for canoeing or, or you know, anything. I mean, actually, the, the water taxi does arrive at the neighboring pier, the neighboring so uh, it's it's it is uh, it is already there. But uh, I mean, I do think that the the New York City is in a, a nascent stage of sort of uh, uh, rediscovering uh, its its waterfront uh, still. Uh, and I think the fact that um, basically, if you look at Manhattan, you have the Department of City Planning ruling within Manhattan, then you have pretty much the entire uh, island encircled by uh, highways, like the Department of Transportation, uh, and then you get the Port Authority in the water. So it's like, it's like three different fiefdoms that, uh, that don't necessarily uh, interact uh, uh, excessively. And I think that, that creates some, uh, some inhibitions. Uh, like we're doing this one project right now, which is uh, the, the dry line, as we call it, or the big U, which is a, a project for, to, for like ac accommodating the coastal resilience of, uh, of Lower Manhattan, uh, all of the, the, the FEMA uh, recommendations for how to ensure Manhattan against the next Sandy, uh, in a way, th through sort of dialogue with the local community, so it actually appears like uh, parks and pavilions and, and landscape, et cetera, in, in, the, in the hope to actually, and we're doing it for the East River Park, where we actually uh, commissioned to do five uh, additional crossings of the FDR uh, as like mini high lines, where you really feel that the public space continues. You don't have to enter some caged bridge, but you actually can just like smoothly run over the, the park and then you arrive at a raised, resilient landscape. So I think maybe 
something like a, a, you know, a massive natural disaster is something that can make the, the DOT, the DCP, and the Port Authority uh, collaborate. But, but I think, essentially, I think a lot of the challenges that I see, like when, when, when you compare how amazingly innovative America is in so many ways, uh, I think the fact that the, the public sector is so f fragmented into different fiefdoms makes holistic thinking and planning quite challenged uh, in many cases. And I think like the, if you could do something on a, on a sort of legal uh, uh, design level, it would be to try to sort of uh, break down some, some of the barriers that exist much more between the different public sectors than it does between the different private companies. You guys have anything to add about my desire for waterways to be more, become more relevant in New York City? I guess the um, the plus pool project. Oh, I'm well, so glad you brought up the plus pool. The plus <laughs> pool which I believe project. is also a Kickstarter, it's a major Kickstarter, a Kickstarter project. project. Yes. Uh, I think that was really a turning point in. I think I mean, New York has been this incredible laboratory for also kind of finding underused areas to exploit within the city, um, and I think London is now considering its own version of the plus pool. I'm not sure it's like a plus, but it's. I think it's like a floating, uh, what do they call them in, in London, uh, marinas or, not marina, but um, Lido, that's a floating Lido. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, somewhere on the Thames. And, uh, and so I think it's, it's also a, a consequence of the sheer value of real estate um, in cities like New York and London, where things that probably previously were considered prohibitively expensive actually become quite affordable in terms of the uh, simple engineering costs relative to the services that can be provided and the communities, the number of people that you can actually serve uh, with, with, with making something floating instead of making it um, on the riverbank, for example. Um, and so I think that actually there's going to be uh, probably over the ten, next five, ten years a lot of ideas of services that can in some way, especially kind of infrastructural um, services for communities that can actually be brought. Also, because a lot of things are, the great thing about rivers is that they are essentially a, a transportation. They, they have built-in mobility. Anything that's floating is inherently mobile. Uh, and so it can also be season-specific. So you can construct something at the plus pool, which doesn't actually need to be rooted in a specific neighborhood for the, the whole of the year, uh, but that could actually serve uh, only certain seasons or certain communities, depending on the, the demand. or um, it. it yeah, it has an extraordinary level of flexibility that's something that's actually grounded on the built-up um, environment of a place of incredibly dense like Manhattan or London would never have. Yeah. I mean, it also, what we're talking about reminds me of um, Bloomberg trying to brand the waterways um, about five summers ago when we had the um, waterfalls by Oliver Eliasson. And it, it, it did bring people um, back out onto the rivers, but it was just a very temporary exhibition, very expensive kind of marketing exhibition, which doesn't seem to have really stayed with us as a city, as a community. Is there something else um, out there that, that we would, should think about? Um, you guys as designers, is there some kind of quick fix to engage um, normal citizens my, like myself a little bit more with the water and, and, and so we can get to this next step about um, really, we would have to proposition the city and, and you know, kind of demand that um, uh, we want something more with, with our waterways. Go ahead. <laughs> no. Well, I think it's it, the, one of the hardest things about the traveling on the water here is just getting there. And because of these original problems of building the city inside of Manhattan and not towards the edges and industry on the edges, you've just ruined um, it's going to take a long time for, for density to reach the areas where it's almost, it's not convenient for me to catch a ferry from Brooklyn to, the set, to Fifth Avenue where my work is because it's just, the density isn't right. Um, I, I don't really have a solution except for time. <laughs> just like a, a fact is actually like, a, the first project we ever built was the Copenhagen Harbor Bath in, uh, in Copenhagen. And before that, uh, nobody, like, it was like as unthinkable to swim in the, the port of Copenhagen as it is to think, uh, think about swimming in, in, in Hudson. 
as it is, the, the water is actually perfectly clean for swimming uh, in the Hudson and the, and the East River, uh, as it is now. The current is a little bit strong, so one should think about that. Uh, I, but I think, you know, I think de Blasio won the elections by swimming across the East River, so, uh, you know, it shows like what, 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 what possibilities it creates. But, uh, but actually, um, the only thing you shouldn't do is after heavy rain showers, and it's the same in Copenhagen today, uh, the sewers overflow, and it's, uh, it's basically you're swimming around in shit, so you shouldn't do it. <laughs> Uh, so that's but why one could go with the plus pool, which has a filtration system. Yeah. Yeah, so exactly, but before the plus pool arrives, you can just like don't swim the day after the heavy showers, and you should be fine. You might even become mayor. Yes. <laughs> All right. So for our um, last quick fire challenge here, um, our, our topic here. Um, so we're here at the Kickstarter headquarters, and I think it's only apropos that we uh, talk about the sharing economy and Uber, uh, you already brought Uber up. Uh, it's an endless, uh, fascinating topic. Um, Uber has publicly claimed that one of its goals is to reduce um, cars by a million on the roads of both London and New York City. So I think this is an amazing, um, possibly achievable goal that we can all get behind. Um, but this is also a company that is valued at more than $40 billion today. So, Joseph, is Uber good or bad? <laughs> Let's start there. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think in, 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 in again, it's one of those sort of um, black and white is never, uh, it, it's never, it's neither black nor white. And I think there are all sorts of things that would be incredibly sad about losing the medallion system and the, uh, I, I think there are a lot of, unquantifiable values that are present in, uh, in the present system, which would be incredibly sad to lose, such as that relationship with the taxi driver. I think like, it's one of those things that you just never consider, you never put any sort of value to, but that conversation with the taxi driver is just so quintessentially part of what makes it great to live in New York. And uh, I, I, I kind of feel like a, a transition to a system which is um, much more, I mean, I guess, the, 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 yeah, uh, uh, conversation with an Uber driver, as long as the drivers are still around, um, is probably equally good, but I don't know how long that's going to last for. Uh, I think the, I think the, it, it, it's in a way, I think the danger of it is um, the transformation of um, everything into uh, a kind of a hyper-competitive environment uh, in which um, one um, I mean, it's, it's really extraordinary if you think about what, in such a brief period of time, uh, a company has on a global level. I was in uh, Johannesburg last week, and um, it was actually completely extraordinary how uh, apparently there were, they were telling me that there were very few taxis around previously, and the few taxis that were there in the, in the space of one year or a year and a half had been completely obliterated by Uber. Uh, and Uber arrived there like, I don't know, two, two and a half, um, three years ago. Uh, so I guess another of the uh, crazy propositions that um, I would put in place as the mayor of uh, whichever city it happened to be would also be a ban on companies that have more than 250 employees. Uh, so I think we can just save Bianca's company. More, I, I'm not sure, but uh, it looked like there are... Uh, we're just going to dodge the... We dodged the bullet there. <laughs> Um, and so uh, maybe I think uh, Uber maybe is a little bit too big to fail, uh, and that might not be a great thing. You guys have anything to add I, about Uber? I, I was talking to a friend today, and uh, he's from Columbus, no, uh, Youngstown, Ohio, and um, actually the guy I did the book with, and Jesse Reed, and um, he said he was back there for, for something recently, and when he was a kid, you could not get a cab. There's about, you know, a very limited supply in the town. And he would have to call, and it would be half an hour, an hour, and you had to have cash, um, and it wouldn't show up. And he said he went back there, and, and Uber was available in a minute and paid on his card. So, it, so I think that is a positive thing for people, um, but probably not for the taxi companies in Youngstown who, who may be out of business. But I think there are, there's two sides, you know, there's the business side and the, the user side. And I think for some people, I think, you know, in New York City, we're spoiled 
with taxis and Uber drivers who are actually qualified as livery drivers, I believe. Whereas outside of New York City, they're actually just regular people. Um, and and the, the rides there are much cheaper as well. So it's a different, I think, to compare it to New York and somewhere else is maybe not fair. I guess also the, um, if, just to make the kind of good or bad com uh, the dichotomy there, uh, to clarify that a bit, I think in the present, it's actually incredibly good. Uh, for example, in Johannesburg, uh, Uber had, had major um, effects in terms of transforming access for people who one of the biggest challenges was getting from one part of town to another part of town in order to be able to work. So it had a massively uh, transformative effect on uh, also in terms of the um, sheer cost. It's incredibly cheap. Uh, I think in the long term, uh, there was a very interesting study on the way that Uber had transformed the real estate market in New Jersey, because it allowed a, a number of people who actually live in New Jersey to be able to commute to work incredibly cheaply. And that had, was already beginning to have an effect on the housing market in uh, New Jersey. Uh, but of course, the problem there is that once Uber manages to squash anybody else who's, else who's in the market, uh, there's, you have very little incentive to maintain the very competitive prices that you have at the moment. and then. Of course, uh, not to mention the, the, the idea that Uber would actually be able to dictate the future of the property market is also kind of uh, possibly has kind of questionable consequences. Right, so from sharing economy to dictatorship. Well, that, yeah, on the very least monopoly, uh, the risk of monopoly. So I think we're at the point where we're going to open it up to the audience. And I know there's two microphones. And so if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, this gentleman right here. Yeah, hi. Um, I have two questions for Bjarki. Um, <clears throat> hi. Uh, you talked about um, Google investing in expensive design for cheap units. Um, and that sounds like a lot of um, approaches that currently exist for software design, basically iterating on an algorithm until, until it's efficient and, and, um, and can, you know, can be shipped. But it's also how IKEA works in the same way, and I was wondering if you can elaborate on that. And um, another question about this is um, currently, if you can draw more par parallels uh, between software design, the way it's done currently, and the way uh, building design is done currently, in the aspect that you know the only two things that we have living in our buildings right now, in terms of algorithms, are uh, algorithms for sustainability, you know, energy management and so on, and the Internet of Things. And they're both piles of crap managed by, by software companies that hoard all the data and are not free. And um, most of the time, buildings are not built to be that way. They're built to be free. They're built to be like open, free of uh, commercial concerns later on because, uh, I don't know, concrete is concrete, a room is a room. And I'm wondering if you had a different approach to designing these systems, like designing, like you said, for example, you, you theorized a Waze-like system for, uh, for, moving, uh, for learning about traffic patterns from uh, mobile phones. And what, I was wondering if you had some parallels on that for dwelling systems. And uh, if you would design them, how would you design them to be free of data hoarders and people who sell your data? Um, excellent. Uh, the, the first one, uh Maybe, uh, I, th I think an, an important difference between what I'm experiencing working with Google and how I see IKEA is that uh, I think IKEA has definitely done a lot in terms of giving access to, uh, uh, to good design. Or, uh, I think what they do is that they tend to primarily uh, take uh, existing uh, designs and typologies and make very, very close uh, knockoffs uh, f uh, and pay, pay designers nothing. Uh, but then, uh, so therefore have absolutely no expenses on development, uh, but then use their scale to uh, uh, suppress the supplier. So like, even though I actually do uh, uh, have a few IKEA things uh, myself, uh, I don't necessarily think that they drive uh, innovation, uh, but I think they do, uh, I mean, because I mean, I think the whole thing about like, uh, like I think to some extent there is something interesting about um, Joseph's idea about questioning the whole idea about uh, uh, copyright and, and IP, which is like a, especially sort of oppressive in a, in a highly legislative environment like uh, like the one in U.S. I think there there is something good about giving access to uh, to the many 
to uh, solutions that really are designed to uh, privilege the many. But I think in that sense, like what, what I'm experienced with Google is actually the willingness to take on uh, seemingly uh, mad goals uh, and really like, you know, like what I think the use of moonshots uh, as a terminology, this idea that when the president of the United States says we will bring a man to the moon within this decade, uh, then just by simply deciding to do it, uh, putting the resources and uh, the brains uh, at work, uh, it, it became, uh, you know, it was achievable, something that seemed like, uh, like pure, pure science fiction. Um, because I, I think at the core of it, architecture uh, and entrepreneurship is about turning fiction into fact. Take something that is purely wild ideas and then doing all the hard work and suddenly it becomes part of the, the world as you know it. Um, so, so I think that's an, that's an important uh, distinction. Um, the second question was, uh, was very well phrased. Open data in buildings and how, how not to, and how to avoid the fact that all of the Internet of Things data, which is currently the only way buildings are digital, uh, will be taken away from us. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I think um, maybe I'm going to mildly dodge the question, but uh, I, I have some friends that have started the, a company it's called uh, Managed by Q, uh, which is some vague reference to uh, James Bond. But uh, it's essentially uh, what, what they're saying, if Uber is the operating system of life between the buildings, uh, then they want to be the operating system of what happens inside the buildings. So essentially what they've tried to do is, uh, is to, in a way what Uber does is just to make systematic services that are already uh, provided. Uh, and I think Basically, what they give is they give a company like, like your own uh, an iPad, and then uh, everything you need, you can just like uh, tab it into that. So then they, they gradually evolve their service. I think right now this, they're operating uh, uh, a, a few million square feet in, uh, in New York. But then gradually they, 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 they refine their service and they become like the service providers of anything you need inside your building. You can order it there. And like similar to Uber, it has a rating system. It has a, a nice uh, headshot of, uh, of the person who's going to come uh, and show up. So like it, it makes a kind of service that is currently, because I mean, think what's good about these things is that um, any, any, any feudal system where people have inherited unmerited privilege is bad for, you know, for society, for the, for the users, for, and I think, I think for anyone who's tried to hail a cab in Paris knows how necessary Uber was uh, uh, when it came out. Uh, and, and, I think, um, and, and I think Managed by Q, in a way, is I think one of the, the most interesting examples of something that is starting to, but maybe they're also going to be data hoarders, but at least they're starting to provide this sort of idea of, of, of intelligence and, uh, and collective coordination to what happens inside the walls. In the scenario of the driverless car, how would that affect the delivery of commerce, which is very difficult in Manhattan now? Would that change it at all? Uh, I don't know whether you saw this, but the um, Amazon has actually started a very interesting experimental program of delivering to oh, your... No, I'm, not, I'm talking like uh, delivery to supermarkets, to restaurants, not to the ultimate... Consumer. Oh, I'm the talking okay. larger scale deliveries where so like trucks are being brought into the city. And logistics. Logistics and UPS and FedEx. And how would the driverless vehicle affect that? I mean, there's a lot of uh, research being done in that. Also, in uh, I think it's Volvo who is experimenting with a system where. Um, apart from like driverless trucks, which are equally as plausible as uh, driverless cars. Uh, but they were experimenting with a system in which you could, on highways or any um, tract of road which is very long, and you kind of tend to go in the same direction at the same speed for a very long time, of actually using trucks as a sort of uh, mother duck um, with all the cars behind. And so it's very easy to, it's quite difficult or relatively difficult to program a car to be able to be environmental uh, and aware of its environment to the degree that it can actually drive itself. But if you kind of pair it up with a vehicle that has 
a train driver at the helm, like a truck, uh, that would actually be able to create a sort of a convoy, and the cars could actually be packed much closer together, so you could have a sort of truck with uh, a number of, um, and that's technology that, you see, you could have like a train, essentially, of up to 20 or 30 um, vehicles uh, behind it that can also handle quite complex situations and that could speed up, that could actually prove, prove much more efficient um, in terms of especially long distance driving. But I think, again, it's just a, a probably a um, intermediate step towards a system which is fully autonomous, which I think is actually a lot closer than we imagine, probably. Maybe also just like in, uh, in the context of the United States, an interesting fact is that uh, uh, the, the, the second most uh, dangerous uh, profession in terms of lifestyle, life expectancy, and, uh, and, and, and health is a law enforcement officer. The most uh, dangerous one is a motor vehicle operator. So uh, just, just because like, I think the fact that you are in traffic all the time uh, is dangerous, and then I think the fact that you're sitting down uh, all the time uh, makes it also dangerous, and the fact that you know sleep deprivation, odd hours, etc. So uh, it's also just like a, it's a profession that's pretty, uh, that isn't doing much for uh, its, uh, uh, its contributors uh, in the first place. So I think th there's something there, like also like having, you know, like s s sleeping, uh, sleeping drivers delivering, uh, uh, you know, goods at 6 a.m. in the morning uh, are maybe s smarter to get off the road. So we've got time for two more questions, if there's two more questions. The woman in the back. Uh, so um, I'm wondering, uh, I mean, thus far I've heard a lot of emphasis on, um, I mean, in talking about sustainability in the future, um, it seems like there's sort of this move towards individualization, privatization. I, I've heard surprisingly little mention of the subways. I mean, are they not part of our future, or what do you think? Subways? Uh, could you repeat the question? We didn't hear the it. The subways, I'm wondering if they are part of, you know, whatever design conception of the future we're talking about in terms of remediating the city. I mean, like, just the way that Uber um, has sort of remediated our use of cabs and, like, how we experience um, driving space. I'm wondering if any of that exists in thought about the subways or in public transportation. I think, um, yeah, I mean, one, one of the things that I still can't, completely wrap my head around coming from, uh, well, most recently Milan, but also London, uh, is how it's possible that in a city like New York that has the most fabulous subway system in the world, there's still, like, in maybe one station out of 10, there are the indicators that say how long it is until the next train comes. Um, and that's just something that I would imagine is relatively, like most cities in I don't know about the US, but I think Washington has them maybe. Yeah. But it's like, why does New York not have this? It's just, it makes such a difference in terms of, and then if you pair that up with some sort of app or some sort of alert system that would actually allow you to leave your house exactly the moment that you need in order to get to the station in time to jump on the subway, you have a like 200, 300% efficiency increase with almost no cost. And the other is wireless coverage or cell phone coverage in the subways. I just, I don't, can't quite figure out like why is that? <laughs> What's the problem? It's like, it's not a big deal. It's just like everywhere has it. Why does New York not have it? It's, uh, I mean, on the other hand, it's also got- a monopoly. <laughs> well, I think, I think it goes back to, which is another conversation, is about efficiency about city government. But, um, yeah. but that's a different I, I, mean, yeah, I yeah. also love the fact the New York subway is like super affordable and it's just like you can get a $30 pass for a vast metropolitan area for um, a week and travel around. So, I mean, I, 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 there are a lot of things that you would put up with, but I think there are just a couple of incremental changes that could be made to... Um, radically transform the experience of the subway and make it so much more um, viable, and also the frequency of the trains. I mean, but these are th these are not systemic changes in a way. They're not. They're not certainly not infrastructural changes. They're things that, or major, infra they're minor infrastructural changes. So I think uh, a huge amount will. Um, but I think the, there are much bigger. I think the reason that we talk so much more about automobiles and about kind of ground level systems is that the si the city is so inefficient in terms of uh, the way that it's used right now. If you just think about the sheer amount of space in the average city that's given over to 
uh, automobile storage. Uh, it's, I mean, it's like the city basically is an automobile storage system with a bunch of sort of residential intervals in between. But it's, it's completely ridiculous and it's, it's insane. So one last question from the woman in the red. Okay, so a question for the panel. Um, so either from a technology or a government standpoint, how would any of you address um, a common problem in a lot of cities where just more and more people are moving in, that there's a lack of affordable housing, that the skyscrapers being built for residential are just not going to be affordable for 99% of the populace? Uh, I mean, there, there is a... There is Aren't the, you building a skyscraper? Yeah, actually, actually uh, I, I am, uh, you know... Part of, part of the solution here. No, like, uh, we had, there is the inclusionary program uh, in New York City uh, where 20%, like the 80-20 uh, system where in new developments there is nested into it 20% affordable, um, which, uh, which is sort of a, at, a, at a city level and a, an attempt to turn the, uh, the economic driver that uh, the real estate prices provide into something that can also propel uh, affordable housing and can sort of uh, ensure uh, a, a diverse population because it is in any city's interest that, that the all income groups should be accommodated because it would be unfortunate if people, if there simply wouldn't be anybody living here that could take uh, jobs that are necessary but ne not necessarily um, make you capable of living in some uh, uh, Massively expensive condo. So, so I, there are actually systems uh, systems in place uh, at present. So, on that note, I'm going to um, uh, conclude with suggesting that being sustainable is having a generous spirit. And so, this is. Um, a, a one panel in a series that the new museum puts on occasionally called the State of the Art. And I want to thank very much first Kickstarter for co-hosting this uh, panel with us. And then, of course, I want to thank very much uh, our esteemed panelists uh, tonight. And thank you for coming. <laughs>